There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all back to Innerverse. This recording is coming at you from July 17th, 2020. And it's a wild time, according to the sky clock, that as above, so below mirror of our internal experience, better known as the Astro Logos, the word of the heavens. And apart from being in the shadow of Mercury retrograde right now, one of the other things that's making waves this summer is the Pluto retrograde action happening in Saturn's home sign of Capricorn. Pluto brings disillusion and change, and one thing we're really seeing as a result is the lifting of various veils between the people and the truth, with celebrities and power holders in all parts of the society spectrum having their predatory practices put forth for all to see. And as Saturn, aka Kronos, he's the ruler of control, borders, and all things relating to time, the time certainly seems to have arrived for the secrets of Saturn to be shown to all who are willing to see. And speaking of the secrets of Saturn, our guest for this episode has a YouTube channel and podcast by that very name, which you can find linked in the show notes or by searching for secrets of Saturn on the interwebs. He goes by Jason Lindgren, and he's a greatly inspirational guy who's been hard at work revealing the hidden hand behind the reality curtain for many years now through his own show and as the co-host on the podcast of our recent guest, Crow Triple Seven. Over the years, Jason has been shining the light of consciousness on just about every mystery and conspiracy out there, and he's also in a band called Cult of Saturn that I hear might just have some new material coming soon. So check the show notes for links to all things Jason Lindgren, and while you're there, consider clicking the link to join Interverse Plus on Patreon, where you can get the second hour of this episode and all the others. And this one's definitely going to be one worth signing up for because free speech isn't doing so hot for humanity right now. And some of the things we'll be talking about in plus just simply can't be discussed on normal corporate channels without the band hammer dropping out of the sky and obliterating us off YouTube. But now let's get cracking on this convo with one of the raddest researchers and secret society sabotagers out there, the musically inclined and cosmically aligned universal truth pursuer and Saturnian secret undoer, Jason Lindgren. Thanks for being here, man. And welcome to Interverse. Well, hey, that was quite an intro. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I do my best to have fun with that whenever I have time to put something together. But I know there's no one better to introduce who you are and what you are up to than yourself. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your personal background and your intentions behind the various types of work that you do. Okay. Well, my name is indeed Jason Linker and that's my real name. It's not a moniker or anything like that. I've been always out there with my real name because I just don't care. And it's just easier to have people call me by what my real name is or my birth name, I guess I should say. Uh, I've been away to things. If you want to use that kind of terminology for a very, very long time, I, early on, of course, I, I found the Alex Jones kind of people out there, uh, Jordan Maxwell, the, the kind of people were out there earlier on in the nineties into the two thousands. It wasn't until let's see, six years ago, maybe seven that I started thinking about doing my own show because I realized that I had just collected so much knowledge in my little pea brain that uh, I wanted to start sharing it with people and having conversations and putting out my own material. So that's where that came from. Uh, I've been into music all of my life. I, I'm older now. I'm 47. And I started in the very early nineties playing uh, original music, was more heavier back then. I was a big Iron Maiden fan and all that. And then as I got a little older, I started mellowing out, started really digging the 60s and early 70s kind of sound, like Pink Floyd and all that kind of thing. But my influences are definitely all over the place now. So that's a little bit about me. (laughs) A little bit, but it's just a drop in the bucket, I'm sure. I guess let's just kick things off with your YouTube channel. What, what, uh, why is it called Secrets of Saturn? You know, what, What are some of Saturn's secrets, in your opinion? Well, when I was coming up with the idea originally to do a channel and a show and music and all that with a a lot of information tied into it, I came up with two concepts. I came up with Cult of Saturn for a music name, for one, because it sounds kind of like a cool 60s trippy kind of name. And two, if anybody liked a song they heard and they Googled or search engined, I should say, 
Cult of Saturn, they'll find a hell of a lot more than a rock and roll band. So it was just my, my way of laying the first stepping stone on a very long path of, hey, there's a lot more to things. You should look this up. And then Secrets of Saturn, well, that was the more blunt way of getting information out. Uh, Saturn, of course, is symbolically in so much stuff. Uh, that, you know, there's the Brotherhood of Saturn and all the stuff that goes back all the way back into the ancient days of Mystery Babylon and all of that. Yeah, there's a lot uh, in that rabbit hole when it comes to the Saturnian influence in our current society. The legal system, for example, is all completely bound up with, I, I guess you'd call it pagan type pantheons, but it's really the Roman version of those pantheons with martial law, maritime law, these type of concepts, things that listeners to my show might not be very familiar with at all. And I wondered if maybe we could start to break in to the, those type of ideas and how the occult actually rules the, the legal system that everyone lives under. Uh, it's kind of a big topic, but uh, maybe we could start by looking at just the uh, very idea of how judges and priests are similar in the, the type of symbolism that relates back to Saturn. Sure, we could easily do that. Now, if your listeners are really not familiar with that at all, go grab a $1 US bill Federal Reserve note and look at it. I mean, really look at it and just look at the amount of symbols are, that are all over it. I mean, it's, it's just loaded with occult symbolism. That's the very first thing I would say to do. If you really want something cute to find, look for the tiny little owl that's on the front. <laughs> I was very amused when that one uh, came to my eye. But anyway, sure, I, you want to talk about courts and you want to talk about maritime admiralty law? Like, do you want me to explain what maritime admiralty means? I think that would be awesome if we could introduce these concepts and give people a good springboard for what to look into themselves and, and see where that goes. So way back when, hundreds of years ago, uh, I don't remember the exact century that this started, but it probably kind of formed itself over time as nation states grew and grew and grew, uh, definitely all tied up with the Roman Empire, of course. The different countries doing trade had to be able to pay one another and have contracts and things like that so that commerce could go on. I mean, commerce rules the world. I think everybody understands that concept. Long before we had terrible things like the Federal Reserve and all that, we had countries wanting to do commerce, doing trade and all that. And maritime admiralty law was come. Uh, they came up with this as the law of the sea or the law of the water so that if you had an agreement that you would, whatever it was, a trade or, or your payment or whatever it was, all of that. And that superseded the law of the land because the law of the land would be universal or would be not be universal to a country. The law of the sea was universal to everyone. If you were doing commerce, you had to take part with maritime admiralty law, I guess that's the, the most basic way I can explain it. Right. And it turns out that the basically the entire legal system that's built for us people on the land that might not even consider ourselves as being involved in commerce is very tied to. I mean, just the very word commerce has a lot of uh, occult <laughs> background to it. It essentially, it, a, an older meaning relates to sex, uh, sexual Congress and we're ruled Congress, by yes. Congress <laughs> yep. and that's the bringing together of a masculine and feminine to create something, a product of that. And when we look at the back to the money example, the fact that there's this, what they call the eye, all seeing eye that everyone associates with the Illuminati on there. It's essentially a much older symbol that refers to something called the eye single or the, it's basically like the creator's, um, the, the third eye or the creator indwelling within an individual that's opening up this unified vision. It's, it's referred to in the Bible as making the eye single. And I think that is about the left brain, right brain, masculine and feminine sides of a being being uh, in balance so that the person can actually see things for how they are, see the reality for how they are. And back to the money again, uh, it's called money, which is mon and I, if you break out the words, which is like saying mono I or one I. It's the I single. And that's it. it they've taken a symbol that's supposed to refer to like the most high or the creator of the cosmos and made it refer to this thing that everyone worships that is money. That's part of how they do Congress or commerce. So 
that there's a little bit of uh, <laughs> more to the money than most people understand. And I think the reason why they put the all seeing eye on the $1 bill and not on something bigger and more important, like a $100 bill is because just about everyone's got at least a one or one dollar bill in their pocket or their piggy bank somewhere and it has almost a sigil like or maybe not almost for sure like a, a sigil like egregore type effect on the consciousness of humanity constantly exchanging this thing it's green it's the heart chakra it refers to balance in a bunch of different ways but only on the subconscious level to the the masses who just think it's a normal part of everyday life no, that's it. It's because the $1 bill is the thing that most likely someone is going to have. Might not have a Benjamin Franklin in their pocket, but yeah, a dollar bill. Absolutely. It's part of the spell. Everything's a spell with these people. Everything's uh, sympathetic magic and all that. But to get back to basics so that folks really understand, you have to, you have to really realize that uh, the ancient elite and, and that is carried forward all the way to today are obsessed with sex. I, I think that's... Uh, it's kind of funny and I, I make jokes about it, how they like to talk about or they like to put up symbols and things like that of big dicks. But the, the, the seriousness of it is, no, it really is all about sex. And you see that even replicated in Washington, D.C. So all that Egyptian symbolism, all the obelisks, all that. Well, the obelisk is a great big penis. That's really what it comes down to. And you have to understand that these people are obsessed with sex and, and you'll see sexual things all wrapped up in it. And I don't want to keep going on and on about that because it's not really, uh, <laughs> that's just not necessary. But when you do look at the, uh, the secret societies and all that, they always have a huge sexual component wrapped up in it. Right. And that's because the sexual creative force that lives in humanity is also the generative principle. So if you want your sympathetic magic to be able to cause a bunch of people to be unknowingly enslaved to you, but also be productive for you, I think you need to be tapping into that generative principle in a sense. And I mean, the, the obelisks in Washington, D.C., they also have the oval office or the ovary office, you could say. And they're both sides of the, the masculine and feminine are constantly being represented in that way. And uh, even that word elites, though, I love to point this out to people. One of the ancient names for Saturn was El. That's where we get like Elohim in the Bible. And right. El, the Elites are the ones. That's what we call the people who seem to be running the show and have all the money and power. They're the elites, but you could also break that into the Elites. Right. And there's also Baal, B-A-A-L. And if anybody's into the Christian Bible... You'll see that all over the place, especially in the Old Testament. So, yeah, these things are all over the place. And a lot of these terms, from what I've noticed, are interchangeable. And, you know, you don't really have to kill yourself trying to learn every detail of everything. Just understand that this is where these people are coming from. They're looking at things that are far older and they're into concepts that modern man is not into, especially your average person just wandering the street with their stupid mask on. You know, just want to get home, watch football and drink beer. They don't understand any of this stuff. But the people who are pulling the strings behind everything, they they are very serious about what it is they do. Yes, indeed. And <laughs> law lawyers have a lot to do with the system, which is a word that sounds a lot like liars. And, you know, if you're out there and you went to law school and you're a lawyer and you're not an evil person, good on you. I'm cool with you. I'm not. I, I hope that people don't assume that there's blanket statements being made about every person that might be involved in, in government or banking being somehow the the main root of the problem i think part of how this sort of hex hoax works is that people are by and large unaware even in the process of acting out the following the orders of the control system you know it's uh it's so baked into people's worldview and reality that it's just an unconscious behavior pattern that a lot of that basically all the western world is um involved with and it has a lot to do with this idea of the corporation which is a dead entity and getting human beings that are live men and women to identify as something that's artificial or corporate. I would love for you to give a little bit of uh, extra context to that idea. Well, right. They've got everything corporatized down, like literally that your name and all that is a corporate identity. This is the way I understand it. And I'm always open to interpretation and learning new material, but the things we've uncovered as we've been, really gone through this law stuff is that most likely this occurred as far as the United States is concerned after the civil war. And then 
they brought, start bringing all this, these systems in, uh, changing everything over. As far as I understand it, and I am conjecturing a little bit here, but my, my best guess is that the United States of America that was set up with the original Revolutionary War was terminated at the Civil War. And then what was moving forward from that point was something slightly different. And I think that's when they began the corporate entity kind of thing as a whole. Now I could be totally wrong, but uh, as far as I understand it, once they started the whole Washington DC act and was that 1869 or 1871, I probably was mixed that up, but in, in that ballpark, that's when the whole corporation really truly started. And then they started corporatizing everything from that point on, they started bringing in, in the 20th century, uh, the federal reserve and then the birth certificates and, and social security and all that, and all that stuff got integrated and all that paperwork. And basically they just turned you into a paper entity and they did it gradually so that people just didn't really know or understand. Uh, the income tax is a great example of this. They brought the income tax in, in the early years, kind of let it fade out, brought it back, uh, during World War II and kind of let it fade back out. But it, then they started ramping it up and ramping it up as the 50s and 60s went on until everybody was paying income tax until you get to where you're at today, where everyone's paying income tax for the most part. And if you don't, you're in big, big trouble. Man, don't even get me started on this taxation theft thing. They hit me <laughs> for like over a thousand dollars this year. And I just have no idea how that even makes sense. But they make they, it up uh, as they go along. Seriously, like the tax codes change so much. You could literally have six different tax lawyer people do do all that stuff. And there's if you, the, the numbers are complicated enough, most likely they're going to come up with six different answers. I mean, if most people only work one job and things like that, like I did for years, the taxes are stupid, simple. You plug it into a program like TurboTax, boom, it's done, whatever. But when you start talking about people actually do stuff and all these write-offs and all, that, all those kinds of things, it's so convoluted on purpose, in my opinion, that you'll start getting different answers at different times and they're just going to do what they want to do. And they're going to bully you to do what they want because that's just the way it works. <laughs> yeah. I think there, it is definitely by design because if it's super easy and simple to just work one job and have no ambitions beyond working for somebody else versus the difficulty of doing your own thing by yourself or God forbid, having to employ people to help you do your thing and sort out all of those tax obligations it says it essentially sets up a system where if somebody they want to get somebody in trouble they just can basically pick out why they screwed up in their taxes or didn't pay enough or whatever and what can you even do it's literally the mafia <laughs> i mean it that's, is the that's one mafia. thing that's really come years. up with your recent episodes especially the one about the medici family on, on crow show is that what we're looking at with government is literally the mafia it's not like the mafia it is actually the mafia <laughs> right no of course i mean this is where you see how modern banking came in and while that name medici may have gotten lost in the families because there are no male heirs don't don't kid yourself those people got into nearly all the royalty we break all that down through the course of two hours that bloodline went into France, you know, just everywhere, just every every country of Europe that mattered, they got in there. Spain, England, Germany, they were there. And we break all that down. That's that's the episode we just released. So lots of banking history there. And and while there was a lot of family bickering and things like that that went on, strip that away and look at what they were actually doing. They set up the modern banking cartels. Yeah, and you know, to go back to this 13 Amendment thing that or you know, post civil war thing. Cause I believe it's the 13th amendment could be corrected on that. That has something to do with the emancipation of slaves and the granting of United States federal citizenship to people, as opposed to them being state citizens, completely different legal situations, by the way. And that's what everyone is that has a social security number. You're not a citizen of the state as its own independent nation. Like it was, it used to be, this is what you're referring to. I think when you said the old idea of what the United States was, ended around that time and the next version the corporatized version began at that time well in the same very emancipation amendments it actually states flat out that there can still be slaves but only if it's a prisoner so what's one way that you can be construed as being a prisoner is through debt and that's what almost everybody in the system is is debt so there's one justification for people to be slaves and then while you have uh, the whole world practically freaking out about the police brutality thing and 
um, joining up with the Black Lives Matter movement that has definite communist leanings and origins and the founders, they're missing the point that the real racism and the real just in general battle is actually more of a class battle, but that like what I've, what blows my mind. And I think you'll understand this because uh, I'm pretty sure it's Louisiana I'm referring to, and you're from Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken, but the, um, I saw someone, only one person talking about this, exposing how the, in the like Capitol buildings of the state legislature in Louisiana, there are prisoners who serve the politicians there and they basically get paid nothing like the same as prisoners who work on the chain gang or make license plates or whatever. But all these politicians are white guys and all of the prisoners that are doing the servant style jobs in the Capitol building are African American people. And the, uh, from what I understand, the, the the political milieu in that state is so tied up with law enforcement that most of the people who are in office are ex law enforcement. So there's a big incentive there for more incarcerations. And that state has the most incarcerations per capita, if I'm not mistaken. And there's, there's so much to it, but I feel like instead of worrying about the, uh, the stuff that the mainstream media is showing you and inciting you into rioting and protests and all that, what we should be talking about is how it's legally institutionalized slavery that's going on in places like Louisiana, where it, it's actually considered to be a privileged job to go work in the Capitol building for, for the prisoners there. And a lot of them are likely there on charges related to, uh, you know, drug trafficking or something like that, that is oftentimes a victimless crime at the very least doesn't deserve the type of sentences that are handed down to them. So uh, it's, it's a sticky issue because as soon as you start trying to dispute whether or not someone should be supporting black lives matter as an idea and trying to maybe widen their perspective to all lives matter, which is considered to be like a hateful thing to say for some reason, and trying to point out the, the real institutionalized battle that is between the classes it's like the brainwashing has given people the uh, the cue that you should just be pointed at and said, you're a racist for even going there. It's crazy. <laughs> okay. Well, that was a lot to, uh, to unpack here, but I'll, I'll do it for you. First of all, um, just to be really clear, I'm from Pennsylvania, but I've been living in Louisiana for almost 10 years. So I'm definitely used to this area. And there is a much higher ratio of blacks versus whites down here than in pretty much anywhere else. I mean, other than some other Southern, Southern states. Now I worked for guitar center for a very long time. Uh, I was a manager for one here and nobody gives a crap about what color people's skin is like, it's just, it, it's next to non-existent. I'm not saying that things don't exist, but for the most part, this racism that's being pushed is manufactured in my opinion uh, based off of experience. I, I've got plenty of people that were clients and, and people I'd go help and, and give breaks to like all these things. I'd help people all the time. Uh, it didn't matter if they were black or white. It doesn't matter. It didn't matter to me then. doesn't matter to me now. People don't care. This is manufactured. This whole black lives matter thing is a manufactured thing. Now I'm not saying that bad things don't go on. I can't prove one way or the other about certain isolated incidents. Do bad things go on? Of course, bad things go on. It's just common sense. But one bad apple does not mean that you destroy an entire country over something that was resolved in the 1960s. And that's something that I see going on. I think that they're kind of revisiting the concept of the 1960s here in this modern decade. I'm seeing that a lot. But people who actually have brains that work realize that it's nonsense, that these are concepts that are 50, 60 years old. And the only place that massive racism goes on is on the mainstream news and on Twitter with a bunch of blue haired land whales making this nonsense up and pushing crap all the time. The same idiots that are going into Hollywood and destroying all the intellectual properties and all that. This is nonsense. This is made up. The average person doesn't give a flip about anything. They don't care if you're gay. They don't care if you're black, if you're white, any of that stuff. Nobody cares. And the few bigots that are still left around, well, there's always going to be assholes no matter what you do. And that's just, that's normal. That's life. You're always going to have assholes. You're always going to have those people who are just pighead and going to think about the things the way they do. And no matter how wrong they are and how ignorant they are, it doesn't matter. But most people aren't like that. So just keep in mind, if the mainstream media is pushing it, it's bullshit. And that's that. Yeah, here, here. I think that's super true. The The division is 
you might as well call the mainstream media the div- division factory. The whole point is to divide humanity along as many lines as possible. You know, you brought up revisiting the energy of the 60s. I think that's a super relevant idea. One thing I've explored on my show is uh, alternative calendars, which is an interesting topic because I know you guys have talked about the the stuff involved with the calendar uh, with Crow and probably on your own program and the origins of the calendar that most people use. There's a Mayan galactic calendar thingy, 13 moon dream spell calendar that some people are really into right now. It also incorporates a sort of different type of astrology. And in this system, there are 52 years in a larger cycle and then there's larger and smaller cycles beyond that. But the idea is that every 52 years, we revisit a similar energy to what was 52 years prior. And so if you go back far enough, that puts us right in part of the Civil War. But also 52 years ago was 1968. And on 4-4, there's an interesting number, 1968, MLK was assassinated. And so right at the, the fever pitch point of the civil rights movement. And then when you look at BLM and MLK through numerology, they're actually the inverse of one another because B equals two and uh, K equals 11, which is one plus one and two. So BLM, MLK, inversion of one another. Very interesting. Yep. Crow's actually been saying that for quite some time now. He's pointed out on, on a bunch of uh, shows. And it's true. So you got to understand that the controllers know these things. We, we might be picking it away at, at a giant iceberg, but these guys, they've got the books. They've been passing this knowledge down. And I'll tell you, they, they use this stuff every day. And there's, just, there's just no doubt about it. They know things that we will never know, and they know how to use it against us. And while we may find things afterwards because we're, we're stitching pieces together, they have been thinking about these things for a very long time. Take the current situation. I have no doubt in my mind that they've been thinking about this forever. I don't know if this is the one and only plan they had in mind, but it certainly is one of them. And, you know, when, when you used to listen to things like Alex Jones and people like that way back in the day, uh, whatever happened to him, how he fell off the wagon went from what he, where he used to be, or maybe he was always controlled opposition. Who knows? Can't really prove it one way or the other. But he did scream about this stuff. And here we are. Here, here we are 15, 20 years later. They had to have had these things in mind because they're always testing things. They're always running algorithms. They're always gathering data and the supercomputer crap that they've got now, just crunching things constantly. They are figuring out how to push the buttons of society and how to get things where they want, which is, of course, total control. And I think it really all ties back to the sky clock, as Crow would say. I The more research I do into trying to find all the dots and connect them to the, the mystery school traditions of the ancient world and how they're manifest in today's society. It does seem like that the real ultimate power is in aligning with nature, however possible. And so putting certain events that align in the right timing to align with the cycles of nature properly does seem like a real way to amplify the results you're going to get. <laughs> you know, speaking of Alex Jones, as a side note, I'd love to see you or you and Crow go in on the uh, looking at the idea that Alex Jones could be the comedian Bill Hicks recast because that or reforged literally because that's a very weird and pretty convincing rabbit hole to get into. And controlled opposition has always been a tool that's used by uh, the Elites. They love to have the problem reaction solution paradigm set up where they get to control both sides of uh, polarity and then synthesize exactly what they want out of it. I've looked at that and I have friends who are very smart and very learned who are convinced of that. They are, they, they, they do think that Alex Jones is Bill Hicks. I do not. I, I've looked at it. I've looked at it. I've looked at it. And it's just, I see similarities. I see lots of similarities, but they're not the same guy. You can go back and find really early clips of Alex Jones and what he looked like in the time period that right before Bill passed away. And they're just, they're two different people completely utterly in the early nineties. Alex was still coming out of his uh, high school, college days where he was a big bodybuilder. I like that. The guy was in amazing condition and he, his voice wasn't as husky. Like you can just see he's, he's much younger and in a, in a, just a very different person than he is now. And you look at Bill Hicks and he is taller than Alex Jones. I met Alex Jones. Actually, I walked right up to him at, at the last time he did a, uh, what was it? The nine 11, um, where he marched around and 
shouted and did all that, you know, what, what he does. I went there in 2007. I was still living in Pennsylvania at the time. And I went to New York to ground zero and all that. And I just walked up to him to say hello and, and tell him what I was doing there and all that. And I'm five foot eight and he was slightly taller than me. Well, Bill Hicks is taller than that. I know, I know Bill Hicks is, is taller than me. Well, th- that is uh, kind of inter- obvious. That's interesting, man. I'll, I'll definitely take that in consideration. I can't say I, I know one way or the other, but I find it interesting. The idea that uh, I believe you guys have probably talked about this type of idea before too, that it's possible that some of the media figures that we see are shifted around and, and repurposed for repackaged in different places. Like, like the idea of crisis actors in uh, various so-called terror attacks that happen in one place and you see the same person crying about it in both videos in different parts of the world, stuff like that. But yeah, I, I definitely find that interesting that, that you have a pretty strong feeling that it's not the same person. I have, uh, I have no doubt that whatever is going on with that guy is, is maybe in some way compromised because of how pro government he wound up going but yeah yeah that's very suspicious and by the way the, to finish that up i wouldn't be surprised of anything if it turned out that he was bill x i'd be like oh well big surprise they lied to us again <laughs> i just don't i personally from what i've looked at i don't see it but i'm open-minded to just about everything i can be and if i it came out that he was okay well, well so be it i'm not perfect but this is this is what I would suggest to anybody who does think that they, they are the same person. Look at what Bill Hicks looked like in 1993, 94, before he passed away, and look at Alex Jones in 1993, 94. They are clearly two different people. The only thing I could see is that the what whatever they faked Bill Hicks' death to become Alex Jones, and that's when Alex started putting on weight and started turning into the person you see now. Um, I don't know, man. I just don't see it. Could be they replaced someone who was a real person as well. But yeah, this is an, maybe an unnecessary tangent. <laughs> uh, well, no, it's it, interesting because you are correct about crisis actors like that. Boom. That's yeah, absolutely. That's a thing. Yeah. And so if you see that being played in one area, then it does stand to reason that it's possible that in other areas we get the same person being more than one <laughs> playing more than one role. And I think part of the reason why that type of thing happens is because one of the illusions put out on cast on people by the L lights and the controllers is that they're way more powerful than they really are. And that there's way more of them that there really are. And I don't see it like, like you were saying about the racism issue. Most people are just regular people like you and me and want to be good and want to have a life where they're more or less left alone to thrive the best that they can. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm 47 years old. My first long-term girlfriend and senior year in high school was a black girl. I didn't care. Like it wasn't an issue. And this is long before everybody started getting all SJW-ish and all that, you know, it was decades before any of that nonsense. It, it's just, nobody cared. She played Dungeons and Dragons with us and she was really cute and really smart. And that was that she was just a girl and we got along and we dated for a while. You know, it's like, this is normal. This is how people are. People are just people. All of the crap that you hear in the mainstream media is either isolated incidents, incidences that they're magnifying to a millionth degree, or they're blatantly manufacturing bullshit, which they're allowed to do by the way, in the United States by law, they are allowed to propagandize. So if you believe anything coming off of the mainstream news, you're dumb. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And if Swamp Thing, I mean, uh, the president was actually the hero that half the country thought he was, he would have overturned that law a long time ago. And instead of just playing pretend like, oh, I'm mad at you, Facebook, because you censored my posts or something. And, oh, we're going to get these big social media tech companies. We're going to force them to allow free speech. And then like the next day, nothing happens. The next day, nothing happens. Crickets continually. There's actually no change being done at all from the top down other than I feel like smoke and mirrors. And even some of the stuff that we'll probably talk about in the second hour regarding trafficking rings, I think could very well be just uh, strategic moves for a different agenda than what most people think they're seeing there. But this is a good point to maybe transition a little. I mean, it's not a big transition, but talk a little bit about the concept of mind control itself. I like to tell people that the word government actually could break down etymologically to mean mind control because you have govern and mint. But you had a recent live stream on Secrets of Saturn where you're talking with 
Andy Kaufman and Crow and uh, another gentleman about the the history of mind control as a warfare, the sort of the new face of warfare. And I'd love to uh, have your thoughts on on that. I didn't get to finish that episode, but it definitely was fascinating. I intend to keep going with it, and I, I'm familiar with a lot of the concepts, but I think this is lost on a lot of people when they've been pushed into the fear of like a potential world war three, not realizing that the, the real world war has been going on for a while and it's a mind war. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Uh, that was just this week's episode with Wayne McCroy and myself. And then Crow was on with us and Dr. Andy Kaufman. And uh, that was actually Wayne's idea to do this one because he wanted to get uh, Dr. Kaufman's take on things from his professional point of view, because he is a forensic psychiatrist as well as an MD. And he wanted to see what things he's encountered over the years and it was it was a great chat and yeah but people that don't realize that the boots on the ground thing like yeah that could happen but it's a hell of a lot easier to get people to police themselves and that's exactly what they've done how many stupid stories have you been hearing about people bitching at each other if they're not wearing a mask or not i mean come on man <laughs> get out of get out of everyone else's faces come on karen go away you you, you don't you don't do that. Just mind your own business. People have reasons for what they do and it's not for you to go poking your nose in. I mean, this is, this is not good. They've got people so convinced of a narrative, whatever the narrative happens to be. And right now they're pushing obviously a huge one. And I would say probably 80% or more people are indeed falling for it. And that's just a shame. And this is showing the validity of the mind control techniques that they figured out decades and decades and decades ago. Like they know what they're doing. I think so. And I think really the mind control techniques go back much further than that centuries or beyond. And it's just that at some point governments got equipped with the, those techniques. Who knows who provided them to them? There was, of course, that Operation Paperclip where a bunch of Nazi scientists got brought to the United States and then other ones went to Russia. And then it's almost like the Cold War was just experimenting with different types of psychological operations to prepare for the big operation, which would be a, a seemingly culminating in 2020, or at the very least kicking into a whole new gear this year. Oh, sure. I mean, you want to talk about psycho op psychological operations in the past, false flag operations. Where did that term come from? Ships running the wrong flag up on purpose to throw people off. Divide and conquer tactics going back, who knows, just using different symbols and things like that. All of that, that hundreds of years, these things have been going on. And these are all psychological operations to sway the people to do what you want. It's always blown my mind that people like a king, for instance, a king or a queen could get hordes of people together to fight on their behalf just because they felt like fighting with their cousin over in France or something like it, these ridiculous notions. And they went along with it. And you're talking about a time when there wasn't a bunch of technology to coerce and manipulate and all that kind of stuff. They just like, okay, the king says do this. Like, okay, what? How many of you are there compared to that dipshit over there? You know, it's astounding indeed. And that's, I think that's what the real secrets of Saturn really are. And, and occult secrets tend to be more true knowledge of human psychology and how to pull, push the buttons and pull the levers on the human mind. And, you know, in, in combination with understanding of nature and natural cycles, utilizing both of those things together has a very potent effect. And you know, hopefully this isn't like a scary conversation for listeners. I doubt it is knowing my audience like I do, but I, I find that it's important to explore these ideas on our own. And that's why I'm bringing them up as often as I am is to hopefully point you in the direction of just looking at, into things for yourself. Wh whenever you learn about techniques of mind control, for example, you're actually learning about how your mind works, not just what elites are doing and trying to do to the world. And the most important thing about that knowledge is that it pervades a certain level of psychological immunity to the person who does know it. They see what's happening with different eyes than those who just take in the information at face value or at the emotional level, non unaware sometimes even of how it's affecting them on the emotional plane. Well, here's a great example that a lot of people, if they're not familiar with it, will really uh, get upset about. Now, I'm a huge fan of the 1960s, just, just about everything about it, as far as music and the culture and all that. Uh, and I'm not even into drugs. I never have been. And that part doesn't interest me. But the majority 
if not, I don't want to say the entirety because I never, I never like making blanket statements, but the vast majority of the counterculture movement and all the things that happened in the 1960s was created and pushed. It was mass social engineering. If you look at the way things went from the 60s into the 60s and walk through the years, it's very obvious how things were manipulated and they had certain key players in key places when they needed to be. And they created all that. And what did it do? It broke up the families. It helped divide America. Again, I'll tell you the one thing that you can always look at with anything that the controllers do, that's divide and conquer tactics. And they use it on so many levels. It's so insidious. But if you just step back for a moment and look at it, you'll see that it's there. I mean, come on, even in the 1960s, they had the Beatles versus the Rolling Stones, just as a good example. Nowadays, nobody would even think of something like that. That's all classic rock. That's all lumped into one big thing. But way back in the day, that was considered two opposing factions which is just ludicrous. Uh, They're all coming from the same place out of England and being pushed by these record labels and just all of that. That's all part of the counterculture movement. Yeah, man, I'm glad you brought that up because only recently some, a part of the modern pseudo counterculture, which is heavily connected into the music festival scene of this uh, North American area. There are, were a bunch of really big artists that have been exposed for their predatory behaviors and going after like very young girls that are their fans and all kinds of weird stuff across multiple genres. And it was, some people are like really angry that this information is coming to light and they're saying that's cancel culture and they're, you're destroying my favorite artists. But with at least a few of them, I can say without a doubt that I already had a feeling that they were like that just from the vibe I got off of their music. And a really interesting example of this fake counterculture is a, a dude named Bass Nectar, who for the last decade has been dominating the the musical headlining sets of lots of big festivals around the country, specifically the big ones that have a ridiculous amount of money behind them. And that alone, the fact that you're gathering 30, 50,000 people in one place to do something should kind of clue you in as to whether or not it's fully wholesome and whether or not you're participating in some sort of mass energetic harvesting and maybe you know real counterculture is more grassroots and organic and is more likely to look like three or five thousand people than 30 or fifty thousand people but all that being said this base nectar character uh he he's been outed for his uh his predatory behavior and all that but at the same time that this was going on i I, someone and i had already called this about him because of literally because of the uh, frequencies that he used and the imagery he'd use in his shows and the fact that I realized that I was being hypnotized in one of the last times I saw him perform at an event. It was like, okay, this is definitely mind war stuff. I found a book from, I think, 1967, sometime in the 60s. It's out of print now. I haven't been able to find a copy, but I have found PDFs of it. And it was called The Laws of Mental Domination, something like that. And it was literally about how to practice psychic mind control abilities and also supposedly was going to lead you to self mastery and, you know, power over other people. But this book had a symbol on the cover that is a 95% match to the logo of the space nectar guy. Like exact, (laughs) it's the exact symbol. (laughs) There you go, man. Uh, You know, here's the thing about big, big, big artists. Celebrity is given. Very rarely is it earned, uh, probably almost never. I mean, you might have some people that that just happen to get up there because uh, I, I'm assuming at some point they got to make money. They Like everything can't be a loss. I could be wrong, but I, I would assume at some point they, they still do, do need to make some money. But for the most part, celebrity has to be given and they create these templates that they follow of these great big pop stars. And I think they got the hang of this. If I had to guess, Uh, Elvis was the first big singular pop icon artist and they were learning the tricks there. And then the Beatles would probably be the number one band or, or um, the teeny bopper thing in the making that they exploited so often as the years went by, but they got the hang of this and on how to do that and how to manipulate people. Uh, even though I'm a Beatles fan, as far as like appreciating the music and the studio techniques, cause I'm a studio engineer. So I appreciate a lot of the innovativeness that was going on at that time and how they were able to do things. So a technological standpoint that hadn't been done before. I know that things were manufactured like paying young girls early on to come scream at them at an airport and get, get it as a, as a press thing and all that. Like the, 
all this manipulation was going on till it became a movement of an, of an itself because they convinced people it was real by creating false events and things like that. You know, again, this is all just psychological operations, but it works. And when you're talking about this cat today, I have no doubt that if he's that big, I've actually never heard of him surprisingly, but is this EDM music? It's EDM. That's probably why I, you I haven't have heard a feeling, of it. I have a feeling that's what it was because I know, I knew some people a few years ago who were really doing big things and talking to me about some EDM stuff. And I, I saw some, some red flags, but anyway, the celebrity is given. And if you're into it, They'll move you up that ladder. And I've always kind of had this funny thought. I, I brought this up a couple of times recently. Let, like, let's just use some examples that you're, you're a good looking dude or a really pretty girl. Uh, you're in your early twenties and you're really hungry to make it. At what point well, if they, if, if the people higher up the ladder can look and go like, oh, I think we could use this one. At what point do you get brought in and sat on a couch and, and you get handed that poop cracker and you're either going to go for it or you're not. And if you eat that poop cracker, you're going to start finding yourself being the biggest fan of the world or the, or the biggest actor or actress and all that. It's, it's got to be something like that because they, they use these people and then you see them how they are early on. And then you see how crazy and, and wacky they are later on in life. You know, all the weird shit they do. Like look at someone like Tom Hanks. Some just some of the weird things he does on his Instagram and stuff like that. It's like, you're not just a normal dude. I mean, you can act like all, like you're all Mr. Guy next door, but you're not, you, you're not, you're just not. Oh man. Yeah. The celebrity uh, meltdowns are super real. Look at Britney Spears is a perfect example. Great example of somebody who got pushed into a situation very young, of course. And then whatever it was they did to her. I mean, I can only speculate, but she's got very good examples of somebody who had traumatic things done to her. And then it broke something in her broke and she snapped and just went and did crazy things on camera. Yeah. Miley Cyrus too. A perfect example. That girl, oh my God, she just, oof. some of these people, like I'm so sensitive to a lot of the stuff now. Like I can just look at them and I can feel the vileness coming off of them. People like Jay-Z and Beyonce and early on, Beyonce never gave me that. Like I just saw her in uh, Destiny's Child and it's like, oh, she's pretty. She's got a good voice. I barely knew who she was years and years back. Now I see the way, what they're doing now. And it's just, they're just oozing with negativity. You know, they, they are indeed the slime from the video oozing out of the television set as it were. Oh yeah. But that's a nice plug for the video you just did. Uh, the music video you just did of uh, the same name, Frank Zappa song cover. I'll link that in the show <laughs> notes. That's great. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's it's that kind of concept though. Like uh, Frank Zappa was part of the structure too, but for some reason he just loved pointing it out to everybody. Oh, some of them do, whether it's revelation of the method or they just don't care and they know that no one's going to really get it or not enough people are going to get it. So I, I have a personal anecdote that I'll share in the second hour of referring to a time whenever I experienced someone attempting to do a type of, magical manipulation on me who was not a famous person but was using music to do it because i think that in some cases there are aspiring sorcerers if you will that get noticed by the high level sorcerers and then they just get picked up on because they've already got an interest in being a manipulator and makes it even easier to use that type of person i think that might be the case with the bass nectar guy but i want to switch gears for the the end of the first hour here and <laughs> maybe attempt to move things towards a bit more of an inspirational finish line in uh, asking you maybe about some of your personal spiritual outlooks on the reality, your, your worldview as it were, or any personal practices that are really helpful for you to staying sane in uh, this w world of madness. <laughs> well, I don't have any particular spiritual practices beyond uh, some meditation the one thing I've, I've learned to have is a very disciplined mind and I can divorce myself from the craziness wrapped around a particular subject and just keep my emotional state out of it. Uh, the Beatles are a good example. If I get in the mood to listen to the Beatles, I listen to them despite all the insane things I know could possibly have gone on behind it all. It doesn't matter if I'm in the mood to listen to strawberry fields, I'm going to listen to strawberry fields. I don't let my logic and my emotions get all bent out of shape. I'm appreciating music for what it is. As an example, um, I'm still a sci-fi geek. I can watch old Star Trek and things like that and appreciate it for what it is, despite knowing that there's messages all through it. And I can identify it. I can see it. So the big thing I can tell anybody who might have trouble dealing with a lot of this nonsense is just try and have as much discipline over your own mind as possible. Uh, if you're into this kind of thing, maybe take martial arts and be very dedicated to it. 
I don't mean, I don't mean be obsessive annoying about it, but just be disciplined, learn how to control yourself before you try and control anything around you. Yeah, that's great advice, man. I think especially the part about martial arts, a lot of a lot of the anxiety that people feel, they just don't realize is some type of energy bound up in their body and that they could be addressed from the physical level. And also like your point about the sci-fi and about certain music, just because a person might have had bad intentions at a lot of points in their life doesn't make everything that they ever did or said wrong or evil. And the fact is that when the faculty of imagination and creativity is being evoked in a human being, regardless of their polarity, spirit can come through and provide messages that the person never intended or even themselves understood that they were putting out there. And that's a, we always see that in art that allows people to have different interpretations and perceptions and experiences of the same artwork from person to person. And that's where the, the higher order of, uh, magic or the higher order aspect of consciousness comes through. And so ha having a disciplined mind is where you can actually get to decide which interpretation is going to go and influence your vibe as opposed to just taking it in unconsciously. Right. You also got to realize that not everybody is working from the ground level in the system. I mean, maybe they are, but I don't think so. I think a lot of people get noticed and like, oh, we can manipulate them. And then they get gradually brought into things. Uh, then there's people who just want it outright. Someone like Lady Gaga, who I just find absolutely repulsive in every way, shape and form. Like the first moment I ever saw this person, heard the name, anything, I just saw and felt the negativity. That's somebody who wanted it so bad that they were willing to do anything to get it. And she got it. God only knows what disgusting things she does in her daily life. Uh, then there's other things, especially older bands. I think a lot of them may have been more organic and I'm just speculating, but let's just say someone like Pink Floyd, they probably started off very organic and got into the system. And a lot of that was still forming in the sixties. Anyway, they were still getting the hang of all that. But by the time you get into the seventies and things like that, I'm sure there was things going on that people like us would look at, would raise an eyebrow to and be like, huh, that's not so good, but doesn't change the fact that dark side of the moon is one of the greatest albums ever and always will be, you know, it's still, you could put that on, listen to it cover to cover and it's awesome. And it always will be. Yeah, man, that's a timeless one for sure. I think, yeah, we can't let this crazy stuff make us crazy, but it is worth investigating and, or at the very least knowing that, like you said, celebrity is never really organically granted, at least not mega celebrity. I think a, a person with a level of, uh, you know, discipline and consistency is going to attract an appropriate amount of notoriety to themselves. So not everyone that is somewhat famous online. I mean, like you and Crow's podcast is quite, has quite a large audience, but that doesn't mean that you had to go through the gatekeepers. In fact, you guys have to deal with the gatekeepers all the time with censorship. But we, we uh, since we got a little bit of a late start, we'll go ahead and wrap up the first hour here because I know that you've got uh, other meetings right after this. And it's so kind of you to spend some time with me this afternoon because I, I know you're up to a lot of stuff. Um, but go ahead and you know get, you can give your plugs or any closing thoughts to the first hour. And I much appreciate your time here today, brother. It's been cool to get to chat with you. Oh, it's been great. I always enjoyed doing these kinds of conversations, especially if you can get out to new people, because you're right, Crow and I reach a lot of people, but there's <laughs> just so many more that, that need to be shaken up and go like, hey, guys, open your eyes, take a look around. But the main show I do is uh, Crow 777 Radio with my partner, Crow 777. He started it. And uh, very early on, I became his partner on it. And I started, I took over the all the production and all that to give it a much more polished sound and all that. So that was more palpable to everybody. And uh, it's just been a great, great partnership for quite a few years now. We're in over 200 episodes. Uh, the latest ones uh, coming out on Saturday is 236. And that, that just shows how many episodes we've been cranking out. You know, it's, it's crazy when I think about it. So that's the main thing I do. And that's crow triple seven radio.com C R R O W seven, seven, seven radio.com. And then every Wednesday on my secrets of Saturn YouTube channel, I do a live stream with my friend, Wayne McCroy. He's actually someone I grew up with together. Uh, we pick different topics, sometimes things that, uh, we may not be covering on crow at the moment. And, um, 
that we think is important, things that we want to get out. Like this past week, for instance, um, we wanted to talk about mind control. And Wayne is really big on uh, documents and, and really just researching white papers and all these things. And he's written a couple of books himself. So uh, if you haven't heard of Wayne McCroy, definitely check him out. He has two books out on Amazon that are fantastic. And we, we get into those subjects a lot, a lot of things on uh, alchemy and transhumanism and all that kind of thing, vaccine damage, because uh, unfortunately he's got children that were vaccine damaged and that's what got him going. So a lot of things there that uh, could definitely be something that's relevant to just the average person out there. Because uh, let me tell you, so even just using the vaccine example, a lot, a lot of people are touched by that in a negative way and they just aren't led to believe the truth about it, that that's a way more common than the mainstream media once again would have you believe. So there you go. Awesome, man. Yeah, well, we'll get into that. And uh, this is such an important subject. Like you said, it's touching everybody. So in the second hour, we'll see what we can fit in, but I'm going to aim to uh, to talk a little bit more about what you've learned from Dr. Kaufman and people like him, especially in regards to the current situation of what you humorously refer to all the time as the beer bug that's going around. <laughs> <laughs> also would like to get your thoughts on this uh, Wayfair thing that just happened because I definitely have thoughts on it. Would like to get them out there and uh, maybe see how we can point the point the direction towards how all the roads seem to lead to Rome and the Vatican and things that we've been discussing today. And that's all going to be, if possible, all going to be in the second part of the show. So we'd love to have you guys hear that. If you want to support on Patreon, you can find the show note or the link in the show notes and see us over there. Thanks, man. Thanks, dude. Great to be here. We'll see you in hour two. All right, friends, we got through another episode and it was so fun. Holy crap. Jason's like my new best friend. I hope <laughs> I would like to work with him more in the future because we have kind of a similar arc. We're both into the nerdy side of things. And if you only heard the free hour and you didn't hear plus, you probably heard me talk about at the very end there, some of the things that I was hoping to fit into plus, And we pretty much got all that in there. But there was an entire bonus part of the conversation that neither of us really expected to get into about comic books and the manipulation of the entertainment industry, the way Disney is using Star Wars for its 100 year plan. This is a really, really cool arc about Luke Skywalker and how it connects to the hero's journey of the sun. So if you want to hear us talk about nerdy stuff and how Disney has ruined our childhoods, <laughs> then maybe check out the plus extension. The other things that we had in there were the uh, war on the middle class, which is what's going on right now, which is basically a war on balance, a war on the middle itself, the in-between polarities and extremes. We talked about the biocapitalism thing, social credit scores, the universal basic income and the gig economy that seems like the next industrial revolution. We talked about video games and mind control. Uh, and we discussed some of the things that Jason has learned from talking with people like Dr. Andy Kaufman about alternative ways of looking at the current situation with the, the uh, pandemic, whatever you want to call it, alternative ideas on the entire notion of why people get sick and at least some parts of why they get sick. Really interesting stuff. And then we also got into the Vatican's involvement with everything basically involved with everything crazy and creepy and dark there's a priest class behind all the banking classes and behind all the rockefellers and rothschilds and all that so it's that's the real secrets of saturn is that the priest class is really tied up with the whole saturnian thing but there's so much more to it it's really going to require you to do your own deep research into the subject there's a book that I recommend that I've been checking out lately called Spirit World, which is W-H-I-R-L-E-D, not world, but world. Yeah, I'll link that in the show notes, but that book will tell you a lot about how the journey of the sun through the Zodiac is pretty much encoded in everything, in every pantheon, all the gods, all the stories of 
uh, all the religions and spiritual traditions and mystery schools, it's all the same thing put into different languages. And guess what? That's how compartmentalization works. If you've got your cult over here thinks that it's got the truth, but this other cult over here has a different version of the truth and they don't line up because you don't understand that it's all allegory and you're taking it all to be literal, then you're going to be easily swayed to go to war with that other cult. And that's kind of what it is, man. We didn't talk about uh, Wayfair very much, I don't think, but that might have got in there at the very end. Honestly, can't remember. Um, I wanted to tell a story real quick about something that happened to me in terms of like a mind control attempt by someone that was a, a music maker. And it's a weird story. I've, pro- I've probably told it before on the show, but I'll try to keep it kind of brief. But we were having this really interesting talk about music at the end of the free hour. And I wanted to fit this story into plus I never did. So I'll just tell it now. So I was at a small gathering music festival. And this was years back, probably like 2013 or 14, probably 14. And there's this dude that was kind of slimy frog looking dude. And, you know, creeping people out a little bit just with his vibe. And he was passing out CDs to everybody and talking about how he was like a shaman and making his music to have some sort of like shamanic healing effect on people or, or whatever magic, magical music. But the deal was he was also really creepy style hitting on and trying to like mesmerize or hypnotize this girl who was uh, there with my neighbor. And she was like his girlfriend, my neighbor's girlfriend neighbor, not like my literal neighbor at home, but my neighbor at the camping grounds. So that that was weird and it got kind of heated between this neighbor camper of mine and the uh, creepy frog music shaman sorcerer guy and seemingly he scared that guy off but he kept like slithering back over and trying to talk to this girl who didn't want anything to do with them and it was just weird it's kind of like how maybe a, a person who can't be a rapist because they're not big and strong enough maybe they're just trying to be a rapist through mind control i'm serious i know that sounds dark but that's a real thing. And I guess that's just kind of what weaker people would do if that was their intent. So anyway, I'm telling this story to um, another friend of mine, like months later, I was talking about how this guy was passing out CDs and how it, while I was telling the story, I was like, I wonder if he was putting some kind of weird mind control attempt or sigils on them, the the uh, external part of the CD case or if he was actually embedding weird frequencies into the music, or if it's just some sort of talismanic thing that by putting it somewhere, it it puts an anchor energetically from him to another person, because that's a real thing. That's actually something I heard that the bass nectar dude was doing would be giving out uh, pendants with his mind control logo on it. And so that creates like when you have a physical artifact that is transferred from one person to another, that creates an energetic link between the two people until the object is discarded or gotten rid of. Be- believe it or not, that's really how it works. So I'm telling this story about the weird mind control frog shaman guy. <laughs> and we're in my car, me and a friend who I'm telling this to. And for some reason, something makes me look down at the space between the seat and the middle console. And I see a slender little thing down there. And I was like, what is this? And I reach down and pull it out. It is the dude's CD that I was talking about, the very guy. I kind of was freaked out, like super freaked the hell out because I never took a CD from him. And it's not like I could think of how he got in my car. Maybe he just got in there and dropped it in there and hit it. Why would he even do that to me? Like, I don't know. How did I even get that thing? I had no idea. So I threw it out the window and I was like, wow, creepy, because It was only when I was like thinking about it that I then found the thing. It was almost like I couldn't even see it for weeks. Like it was somehow glamored to be hidden from me. Anyway, that was a long time ago and I had a lot less understanding of mind control back then, but I just knew it on a, like a vibe level that something was up with that guy. Anyway, don't try to mind control each other guys. Be cool. (laughs) And, uh, Make sure that if you want to hear the second hour of this conversation that you go to patreon.com forward slash plus no (laughs) patreon.com forward slash interverse and then you can sign up for plus there's a couple of tiers there we're going to do the multiverse conversation which is for the $12 donators we're going to do that pretty soon which is like a group patron chat that uh, we can kind of hang out and we'll publish that just to the patrons only and It'll probably be about like a 30 minute thing unless we're really rolling with it. Maybe it'll go longer, but 
we're going to definitely do that real soon. And that's going to be a monthly thing from now on. And go subscribe to Jason's channel, Secrets of Saturn. If you didn't already get on Crow 777 Radio from last week's episode with Crow, do that too, because Jason's his co-host over there. And yeah, wow. I'm really feeling fired up right now. It's been an awesome day, awesome weekend. I mean, yesterday I recorded three podcasts. Wow, that's like my record. And I published and produced one. And now today I'm about to throw another one out there. So thanks for being patient while I had to uh, wait between publishing episodes for over a week because now I'm dropping like two in a row. I'm feeling good about it. I think it's the biofield tuning with the tuning forks that's really charging me up or something. But I've got the juice and I'm here to use it. And I uh, love you guys. Appreciate you. And maybe come jump into the Interverse Discord if you want to chat with us more, chat with me more, connect. I mean, there's some really great people in there. We'd love to have you. You can find the link probably in the show notes if I remember to put it in there. And uh, definitely at my website, interversepodcast.com. And yeah, you know what? Let me tell you this real quick too. Here's why you should sign up for Plus if you have $5 to spare. Do you ever go out to restaurants? I mean, I kind of stopped doing it, but every once in a while I do. And it seems like around here anyway, for the amount that food costs, people tend to tip like $5 per person. Five dollars to the the server whenever they got their meal and it was good. Like cool, five dollars. So that's how little of a deal five dollars is to a lot of people that they tip that. And when you think about it, going going for plus on Interverse, getting the second hour of this show and all the other second hours that you unlock, it's a lot better than just. <laughs> it's a lot better deal for your tip than uh, what you would get for tipping a waiter. Cause you know, you, you're tipping him cause he brought you a meal and he served you for like 30 minutes or an hour, however long you're there. But I'm serving up countless hours, man. So many hours of content that you get for the $5. So what if the waiter, after you tipped him five bucks, he brought you an entire extra meal that was bigger than the meal that you had to begin with. Cause that's kind of like what you get if you tip me virtually on Patreon. But Hey, if that doesn't convince you, whatever, Lots of people are supporting. I love those people. I love you for tuning in anyway. I get it if you don't have the five bucks to spend. I'm not mad. <laughs> there's there's always enough. You know, there's going to be supporters. More supporters are coming and I love it. And uh, things are growing and expanding and I'm feeling more complete and whole and powerful all the time. Got a lot and a long way to go on my self-healing journey, just like probably all of us. But dang it, I feel like I'm definitely on a trajectory right now and I'm excited about it. So you guys have a great rest of whatever day or night it might be right now. And I'll talk to you soon. Got some great stuff already recorded. Just need to put it out there. So take good care of yourselves. Love each other. Stand up for the truth, first of all. And uh, don't be scared of the tyranny. All right. Oh, hey, before I go, let me tell you, I'm going to play you guys out with a song by Brett William Dietz. I think that's how you say that. It's a cover of Frank Zappa's I'm the Slime, hilarious song, featuring Jason Lindgren, our guest today. He collabed with Brett on this song, and I thought it was pretty perfect and fitting for the conversation we just had. So that's what I'm going to play us out with. I'll link that in the show notes, too. And I'm out of here. Love you all. Bye-bye. Until the rise to you are sold. Mm -hmm.
This has been Anderson Pooper Scooper reporting.